morning. This is what I woke up to this morning. This is Shoshone Falls on the mighty Snake River. And let me tell you, I've been to a lot of waterfalls in my life. And this one is pretty spectacular. It's taller than Niagara Falls. It's actually running at relatively low water right now. During the spring melt, it's like a thunder. You can't even stand where I'm standing. The force of the, the wind and spray from the falls would just knock you over. This is amazing. When I was a kid, I saw a picture on a calendar of a waterfall. And the name of the waterfall was not on the calendar. And at that point in my life, I had seen a few waterfalls in person. And I had seen pictures of hundreds of waterfalls because I was a geek and I read encyclopedias for fun when I was a kid. But there was this one thing about the waterfall that just really captured me and, and I couldn't get it out of my head. And I spent hours reading my encyclopedias trying to find out where this waterfall was. I had no idea even what country it was in. And uh, I couldn't find it. And this waterfall haunted me even into adulthood. And so when the internet came about, I started just frantically searching and searching and I finally figured out that this waterfall that I had been dreaming of all my life was Fall Creek Falls on the Snake River near Idaho Falls in Idaho. But Idaho's a long way from Texas and there aren't that many major airports around. So I never actually got to visit this waterfall until today. And I'm about to see it for the first time. I'm feeling a little bit emotional about it. Um, and so there's really no telling what's gonna happen when I lay eyes on this waterfall for the first time because I've literally wanted to see this waterfall for 25 years. Um, it's actually a pretty secret waterfall. I talked to several people in Idaho Falls, none of them have heard about it. And uh, to find it, here's what you do. We're on the Snake River Road near Swan Valley, Idaho, and uh, you cross this completely unmarked bridge on this dirt road. No signs at all. There's a creek right here. This is the creek that later becomes the waterfall, but again, there's no markings. Just past the bridge on the road is this completely unmarked gravel turnout. And as you can see on a beautiful June weekend, on well, Saturday, there's only one other car here. No markings, nothing. So I just spent the last hour exploring the falls. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't film my initial reaction to seeing them, but that was actually a pretty private moment for me. I did take a photo after I finished crying. <laughs> Put that up there for you. But uh, yeah, this place is amazing. The water just dances off the cliff surface, probably 300 feet all the way down the Snake River. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. It is so, so beautiful. Waterfalls like Fall Creek Falls deposit travertine, which is basically dissolved limestone or calcium carbonate that exists in the spring water. And when it goes over the surface of the fall, it deposits tiny particles of this limestone or calcium carbonate on the surface. And I've always really been drawn to travertine waterfalls. There really aren't that many of them. I've been to a few. And uh, over the years, you actually discover that the waterfalls develop caves as they build and build and build. And I'm actually in a little cave in an old part of the waterfall where the water doesn't flow anymore. It's shifted direction. And uh, this is really cool. It's just amazing. You can see the movement of the water frozen forever into stone here. This is just a miracle. And now it's time to climb back up. Easiest pie. So I'm just east of the little town of Cary, Idaho, <laughs> and I'm a couple miles from the Craters of the Moon uh, National Monument, which is a volcanic lava uh, field. And I keep seeing these like little springs by the side of the road, and I thought, you know what? 
volcanoes and springs typically means hot spring. I wonder if there's a hot spring here. And so I pulled out my little guide to hot springs and it turns out I was like less than a quarter of a mile from a hot spring right on the side of the road. It's called Wild Rose Hot Springs. I've never been to it. I've never even really read about it until I just looked at it right now. So uh, I am actually just about to come up over this ridge to where the hot spring apparently is. So I'm actually really excited. This is a cool surprise. Let's see. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Totally hidden right here on the side of the road. I had absolutely no idea. Oh my goodness, I can't wait to get in. Wow. <laughs> this was a find. I have to say, this is one of the best hot springs I've ever been to. This pool is so deep and it's the perfect temperature. It's not too hot. It's like 50 feet from the highway and nobody knows that it's here. This is totally amazing. I'm gonna have to swim in. I never get to swim in a hot spring. This is so cool. So this is one of the many cinder cones out here in the Craters of the Moon National Monument, which is really not on your way to anything, but is a really, really interesting place. It's just a bizarre landscape. I climbed down into one of these spatter cones. You know, this is just a really bizarre place. I've flown over this on my way to like uh, Portland and Seattle on commercial flights before. I've never actually been here and it's really kind of cool. It reminds me a lot of Hawaii, except that it's Idaho. Bizarre. And of course, where there's lava, there are almost always lava caves. And you know me, caving is my hobby. And I love lava caves in particular, but I'm not going to go into this one or actually anyone in the park. And there's a reason why. Most of the caves in the continental U.S. right now are actually under threat from a disease to bats called white nose syndrome. And they believe that it's spread from cave to cave by cavers with mud on their shoes as they track from one cave to the other. Now this fungus affects the bat population and it can decimate an entire cave's population over the course of one year. I don't know, a lot of people don't like bats, and they're like, oh, what's wrong with that? Well, I'm going to tell you this. If all the bats in the United States became extinct, there is not enough bug poison in the world to keep all of the insects from eating all of our crops. We would all completely die out and become extinct if it weren't for bats. They are almost as important to human survival as honeybees are, which are also threatened right now. So I'm going to avoid going down into this cave, even though... The floor of this cave is a pure sheet of white ice year round and I really want to see it. But uh, I've got to respect the bats and make sure that they stay safe so they can eat bugs so we can continue to put food in our mouths. So goodbye cave. Maybe someday when the disease is gone, I'll be back. So I've just driven four hours out of my way to the middle of nowhere <laughs> in central Idaho to visit a hot spring that I've wanted to visit for over a decade. It's called Goldbug Hot Springs. It's apparently one of the best hot springs on the planet. And I know this video has been very heavy with hot springs, but as you can obviously tell, I love them. They're magical. I've soaked in hot springs on all seven continents, actually. And uh, while this trail is only two miles long to the Goldbug Hot Springs, it gains over a thousand feet in elevation during those two miles which is basically more than a 10% grade for the entire duration of the two miles. And whereas most two mile hikes would only take me about 30 to 40 minutes to do, I have no idea how long this one's gonna take me. All I know is it's not gonna be fun. And it's actually a little uh, toasty, maybe 82 or 83 degrees today. And I'm going to Sogan Hot Springs. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm the smartest person out there right now, but uh, we'll see. Already, uh, I'm pretty hot. <laughs> so according to everything I've read, the hot springs are up there. That's how far and how high I have to hike to get to them. It's not going to be fun. Got a snake here. Pretty long. Just 
really long. Wow, pretty. Oh man, I've been hiking for 45 minutes. That's normally the amount of time that it would take me to go a couple miles. And when they say this trail is steep, they mean it. I am so, so tired. I hope I'm close, but something tells me I've got like another half a mile to go. Oh, oh it's uh, 54 minutes and I finally made it to the first pool. Look at this. Oh, beautiful. There's a creek behind us. And there are more cycling pools across the creek. Oh yeah. Wow, this is tough. Oh gosh. <laughs> I will eat my shoe if there is a hot spring anywhere in the world with a better view than this. Oh my goodness. Totally worth the grueling hour of slogging up here. The only thing on this planet that could make this any better than it is right now. An IPA, of course. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, yeah! Woo! Man, that's good! <laughs> Woo! There's so many pools and each one's a different temperature. This one's actually the hottest, but there's a layer of ice cold water like this deep at the very bottom of it. So you get a nice surprise when you sit down. So after you stir it up a bit, it's perfect. Going back down is so much more pleasant than going up. <laughs> I passed this little lean-to sort of cabin looking thing on the way up. I'm not sure how old it is, but it's pretty old. Um, it's even quite possible it was made by the Native Americans. This whole area has been revered by the Native Americans for millennia. And Sacagawea, who was the Native American guide who helped get Lewis and Clark through this part of the world, was actually born right here in this area. So it's actually entirely possible that Sacagawea herself soaked in the gold bug hot springs at some point because they were considered medicinal and holy by the Native Americans. Isn't that cool? Well, 55 minutes up, an hour of soaking, 40 minutes back down to my car. I'd say that's not a bad way to spend two and a half hours. So if you ever find yourself in the area around Salmon, Idaho, gold bug hot springs. Check it out. So this is Yellowstone. I barely just drove into the border of the park and there is this impossibly green meadow filled with bison. And there are babies down there too. They're so cute. You know, we, we have buffalo in Texas. Actually, I have some within a mile of my house. Uh, some people grow buffalo, but for some reason, it's just, <laughs> it's amazing to see them out here in the wild. I really don't have any words for this. So I just got to Old Faithful and uh, some other geyser in the basin below it is just going off like crazy. <laughs> it's like a 50 foot plume and it's roaring over here and I don't know if you can see but at the base of it there are tiny people. Like this is, this is really crazy. Welcome to the most famous geyser in the world, Old Faithful. Right over there and they say She's going to erupt sometime in the next 10 minutes, so I'm going to hang out and see what I can see. It's my first time. Good morning. Now, even though Yellowstone is in the absolute middle of nowhere, 
it's still one of the most crowded of all the national parks. And I am actually scientifically allergic to crowds, especially in nature. My first time to Yosemite, uh, the trails were like lines for an amusement park, and I swore I would never go back. So I was very trepidatious about coming to Yellowstone for the first time. So here in the Upper Geyser Basin near Old Faithful, which is the most crowded of all the trails, I uh, decided I was going to get up at 6 in the morning to hike the Upper Basin just to make sure there weren't really that many people there. And uh, I don't like getting up early, but I think this is worth it. I'm walking on a boardwalk and I'm in one of the most crowded national parks in the country. We are in fact in the middle of the wild, wild wilderness and there are giant dangerous wildlife here. Bears, lots of black bears and lots of grizzly bears. There's a grizzly about a quarter of a mile up the trail this morning the rangers told me. There are cougar, there are wolves Wolves still exist, and they th they're thriving in Yellowstone after being reintroduced. Um, and then, of course, the bison and elk can be dangerous as well. So I'm uh, committing a big no-no and hiking by myself. So I'm trying to make a little bit of noise so that I don't surprise a bear, and uh, he uh, decides to make me his breakfast. So if you're going to be hiking in the backcountry in Yellowstone, you have to carry bear spray. It's really the only way that you can uh, have any hope if a bear decides he's going to be aggressive toward you. Now that is one of the strangest things I have ever seen. This is Grotto Geyser, and it's weirder than the last one I saw. They keep, just keep getting weirder and weirder. Morning Glory Pool used to be totally blue, deep, deep, deep blue, just like a Morning Glory. But over the past, visitors to the park have been throwing rocks and coins and things like that in there and it goes down and it's been plugging up the main spring channel so the temperature of the geyser has gone down and the cooler temperatures allow yellow and earth colored bacteria to flourish in the water rather than the true blue color of the cyanobacteria that live in hotter temperatures so the pool color is slowly changing to yellow and yellow's pretty but to be honest I'm gonna miss the blue Behind me is the Riverside Geyser, and I think it's one of the coolest geysers I've seen so far. It's perched right on the Firehole River, and it erupts every five to seven hours. It just shoots out an arch of water right over the river. So I'm gonna hang around because one of the park uh, geologists told me he thinks it's gonna erupt sometime within the hour. So I've got a lot to see and do today, but I think I'm gonna chill out for just a little bit, read a book, and wait for this geyser to go off. There she goes. Wow. Wow. This is no minor eruption. This thing is still going on like 10 minutes later. And all faithful's going off again. And uh, this raven doesn't seem to care at all. And he is practically as big as a turkey. I'll bet he would make a delicious pie. However, he is eating bison poop. So if his primary diet is bison poop, he might not make a very good pie. Ever since I was a kid, there are two things that I would see 
and National Geographic magazines that really made me want to go to Yellowstone. And this is one of them. That is the Grand Prismatic Hot Spring. It's the biggest hot spring in all of Yellowstone. It's one of the biggest hot springs in the world and there is nothing else in the world like it. The color is just amazing. Now, there is a trail to the Grand Prismatic Spring from the Midway Geyser Basin parking lot. And it will take you right up to the edge of it and there will be steam in your face and you won't be able to see a thing. The only way you can see Grand Prismatic Hot Spring the right way is to take the Fairy Falls Trail nearby for about 10 minutes and then you'll see a dirt trail unmarked leading straight up the hill. Climb up that dirt trail for five minutes and it's there. It's the best 15 minutes that you will spend in Yellowstone. This is unbelievable. Wow. One of the only real places in the canyon area to escape, the majority of the crowds is right here at Brink of the Lower Falls. It's one of the scariest places I've ever been. And the trail down is really steep, so you only get a fraction of the normal crowds that you get at places like Artist Point. But even so, I had to wait 15 minutes for my turn to take a photo in this one spot, so it's not like it's deserted. I wonder why they call it Yellowstone. Oh, that was sweet. Oh, did you see those fish jumping over the top? Pretty cool. Oh, there it comes. Oh, service, service, service. We'll be able to take our picture, would you? Sure, of course. So, a little while ago, I just left Mammoth Hot Springs, which is the second of the two places in Yellowstone that I've always wanted to see since I was a kid. I didn't take any video footage while I was there because, quite frankly, I was in a terrible mood. When I arrived, it took me about 30 minutes to find a parking spot amid the chaos of tourists. And when I got to the trail that winds up through the mineral terraces, it looked like the ride, amusement park ride line for the opening day of a new roller coaster. And this is just one of the many examples of the fact that our national parks are overcrowded. And this is a really tough issue with no easy answers because obviously we need to set aside our most dramatic and beautiful landscapes for preservation and so that the people of the world can come and enjoy them so that it teaches them to respect and take care of the earth where they live at their own homes. But on the other hand, if you build four lane highways and hotels and restaurants and gas stations in our national parks, everyone will come to them because it's easy. You don't have to earn it. And I'm really conflicted about that because part of me really wants to be able to feel like these spaces are still pristine and untouched and ready to be discovered. But on the other hand, a lot of our folks that live in urban areas don't have enough connection to the wilderness anyway, and they wouldn't come here if they had to earn it. So, certainly not an easy issue. But that's the reason I started my day out at six o'clock this morning, because by 10 o'clock, this place looks like an amusement park and it stays that way until around five or six o'clock when people start going back to their hotels for dinner. So if you are wanting to spend a solitary vacation in Yellowstone, plan a week here, spend your time on the trails from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and from 6 p.m. to sunset. And the rest of the day, sit back underneath a tree with a good book and enjoy yourself. That's really the only way to do it. As for me, I've about had enough of the crowds, and I am going to head south and get out of here. And of course, the instant everybody saw me with my camera set up pointing at me, they started looking at me, and then I got marauded and had to take like 15 pictures with people at Artist Point uh, right after I got done filming. But, I mean, it, it was kind of fun. I guess people don't expect to run into people they see on television in national parks, but I guess sometimes it happens, right? So I had to stop and show you just one more thing. On the far south end of the park, I'm on the shores of Yellowstone Lake, which is the biggest lake I've ever seen short of the Great Lakes. And uh, this is a really cool feature it relates to cooking. The fishermen would stand right there, catch trout in the lake, and then lift the trout up still on the hook and dunk it into this boiling fumarole right here and cook the trout right there, seconds after caught. How cool is that? So you know that I can't stay more than a day without going to a hot spring whenever I'm in hot spring country. I just left Yellowstone. And in Yellowstone you can't soak anywhere because number one, the water's too hot. And number two, it's illegal to soak anywhere except for two areas and those areas are not good anyway. 
So I'm actually in the Polecat Hot Springs, which is just like five miles outside the park, just on the south side of the park. And because the park doesn't own it, you can soak here and it's the perfect temperature. It's a little bit murky and there's some mosquitoes around, but you know what? After camping in Yellowstone for like three or four days, this is the most wonderful feeling thing you will ever feel. Have a good night, I'll see you tomorrow. So, uh, this is what I woke up to this morning. <laughs> you know, I've been on the road for almost three weeks and with so many incredibly beautiful things to see. When you see stuff like this, your brain just doesn't work anymore and it just kind of stares at it dumbly and thinks, is that real? <laughs> wow, the Grand Tetons are so beautiful. Really? Historic barn, bison, and the Grand Tetons? For real? <laughs> I feel like I'm still in my hammock at the campground asleep and this is all some sort of weird dream. This is, oh. Another day, another hot spring. This is the Ogden Hot Springs in Ogden Canyon <laughs> in Utah. <laughs> This is Raspberry. You saw him earlier. He just met me up in Salt Lake. And uh, it's like 98 degrees out here. <laughs> and we're in a hot spring and it's so hot. I had to get my sun, like, sun shield from my car to keep us from roasting alive. And yet we're still sitting in 102 degree water. That's true. Why are we doing this? I don't know. We're fools, Raspberry fools. But we're doing it anyway. I can hot springs in June, man. 98 degrees. Awesome. So we're on our way from Salt Lake to Denver, and I is it I-70? This is what we're on I-70. So yeah, I-70 runs just 30 miles north of Arches National Park. And Raspberry, who's with me, has never been to Arches. I've only been once. So we decided to sacrifice a few hours and come down here and drive through the park because it is really one of the most beautiful places that you'll ever see. It's really amazing. Raspberry's all excited, right, Raspberry? Totally excited. Yay, okay, here we go. Film a little bit of that stuff. <laughs> So we're here in Idaho Springs, which is a little town about 30 miles west of Denver, just up in the mountains. And this is the Indian Hot Springs Resort. And this is a historic place. It's been around for 150 years. Walt Whitman, Oscar Wilde, Teddy Roosevelt, all these people stayed at this place. And the reason I like to stop here is because underneath the hotel there are caves that have hot springs inside them. So I'm gonna try to take the camera down and show them to you, but the camera can only go into the cave for a few seconds before it would fog up and get all messed up. But we're gonna try, let's go. Okay, so we're about to enter the steam caves underneath the Indian Hot Springs Hotel. And the first part is the shower cave and it's not too moist in there, but as soon as we hit the main hot spring cave, the lens is gonna fog up really fast. So I'm hoping you can get a glimpse of it before it goes crazy. I believe that these are old mining tunnels from like the 1800s and they encountered hot springs in them, but I could be wrong. And then yonder are the caves and the hot springs are inside. It's really dead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is it gone? No, go for it. Oh, okay. And they're just little pockets of hot water that range anywhere from like 104 degrees to 112 degrees. All the way back. It's the hottest pool in the very back of the cave. Each of the caves are gender segregated, so the women are in a cave over there and the men are in a cave over here. But we're the only men in here right now, which is really cool. So we're, we're in the mountains just north of Denver and I just found out that Ray Bradbury died. 
and he was my favorite author by a large margin. His book, The Halloween Tree, is this big, and it was written for kids. I didn't read it until I, for the first time until I was an adult, and I've probably read it hundreds of times, and I've read it out loud to classrooms and families and friends. And, and his other two books, oh, goodness, sorry. His other two books, Something Wicked This Way Comes, and, uh, uh, and Dandelion Wine were my two favorite um, books. They were written about his childhood in early Americana, growing up in a very small town north of Chicago. And, of course, he's best known for his books like The Martian Chronicles and Fahrenheit 451, uh, his science fiction novels. But it was his uh, Americana books that really resonated with me. And uh, when I was a kid, I actually got to meet him several times when he would come to speak at the university in the town where I grew up. He would come to church on Sunday at my church. And so before I even read any of his books, I met him and my father told me, this is an amazing man that you should meet. And so I had a really special connection to Ray Bradbury. He's one of the greatest American authors of the 20th century and I will very much miss him. Oh, okay, turn it off. I like to put on Facebook and Twitter a memoriam to Ray Bradbury. And because I'm driving in the mountains, I was using my talk to text so I didn't have to punch it in. But because I was crying, it didn't understand what I was saying. And so this is how it transliterated it. To capture the heart of mine, to children and adults alike, took forever just to let a stick of butter. <laughs> Which he probably would have appreciated. <laughs> So I'm on my street, I've driven 6,700 miles in the last three weeks. That averages 320 miles a day, but there are quite a few days when I didn't drive at all. So uh, I covered a lot of mileage in the last few weeks. And my puppy dog is about to go absolutely crazy when I get home, so. Uh... Hey baby, hi, oh goodness. Oh goodness, oh, oh yes, oh hi, oh goodness, oh slobber, oh goodness, oh goodness, oh hi.